one of the fattest countries in the world. Over the next half an hour, we'll take a look at why and what experts say can be done about it. Welcome to this edition of 11 TV Hill, everyone. I'm Jason Newton. Let's start with some stats about just how bad the obesity rate is here in the U.S. The latest numbers from the Centers for Disease Control show 30.4% of Americans are obese. That's defined as having a body mass index of 30 or more. And that's up from 19.5% back in 1997. Obesity rates highest among African Americans. 45% of black women are obese compared to 28% of white women. And children, they aren't that far behind. A new study shows the childhood obesity epidemic also continues to rise. Duke University researchers say obesity rates have climbed significantly since 1999. In fact, 33.4% of American children were overweight in 2014. And among those, 17.4% were obese. And the largest increases were in severe obesity, which now affects an estimated four and a half million kids and teenagers. And a national health and examination survey suggests that we form bad eating habits very early in life. Many babies, in fact, develop unhealthy eating habits by the time they're just nine months old. The survey shows that as infants transition out of baby food, they eat more French fries and sugary foods and vegetables and whole grains. In fact, many are consuming adult levels of sodium and added sugars by their first birthday. And the cost of treating obesity in patients very astronomical. A recent report showed that U.S. spends an alarming $147 billion per year on obesity-related care, with type 2 diabetes care costing the most. That same report showed that obesity people or people with obesity pay on average $1,400 more per year on health care compared to those who maintain a healthy weight. So joining us now, dietitian Charlotte Martin. We know the obvious question here is, is the why and how, but just talk right. about the cause. What do you think caused it in most people to end up living that lifestyle? Right. Well, Jason, there are numerous factors that can contribute to these increase in obesity rates, yeah. such as sugary beverages, uh, oversized food portions, and just lack of access to healthy food items for many consumers. And we could sit here for the next hour and try to list all of these. Sure. Um, but the bottom line is that obesity is generally caused by eating too much and just moving too little. Sure, sounds so simple, but, but <laughs> right. with the numbers that we just talked about, clearly it isn't. Right. So are there solutions that you think could maybe make things a little easier for people to find their way out? Sure, now nutrition education and teaching healthy habits starting in childhood and into adulthood mm -hmm. is extremely important. Now, when it comes to weight management, I like to use the analogy of the three-legged stool. Okay. So each leg of the stool represents an extremely important part of weight management. There's healthy diet, yeah. exercise, and behavior change. Many people forget the behavior change sure. part. It's a, it's a huge component. So when all of these legs are solid, the stool is solid. Sure. But if one is broken or missing, the stool falls over. Hmm. When you hear the word diet, do you, do you get chills a little bit? Because I hear people move away. You even said weight management. Mm -hmm. Does diet take it to the extreme sometimes? Uh, I think it depends on the person. Yeah. Um, I like to use the, the term weight management. Yeah. Um, it encompasses weight loss and weight control weight maintenance mm -hmm. as well is extremely important but you know weight management in general is extremely challenging there's no one-size-fits-all approach yeah. and you really want to tailor any approach to the individual yeah we were talking about kids earlier and yes. I know with kids who go to school with lunch it's so easy to grab the fruit roll-ups and right. all the stuff that looks really good on the box right. which is probably really bad how do you start that process early as you're shopping with kids and just finding mm -hmm. the right things that they'll actually eat right I like to recommend just getting them involved. So taking oh, okay. them first to the produce section and having them pick out, you know, what stands out to them. Okay. You'd be surprised how much children love fruits and vegetables yeah. when you just allow them to participate and be involved. And I also like to recommend um, that parents try to include at least one food from mm -hmm. four out of the five food groups in their lunches okay. so that they get a variety. Sure, and then you have to find, I guess, that balance of, of doing the eating the right things, but also right. getting moving a little bit, which I guess can be a task as well. Right, so e excess weight is really the result of an energy imbalance. So oh, okay. too much calories, too much energy coming in, and not enough energy being expended. 
Sure. So it's really important that we engage in regular physical activity to expend more energy, and that'll help bring us to a state of energy balance. Yeah, we talked about genetics early. I know it's not your field, but is there anything that supports that if a mother or father and grandfather may have been obese, that the offspring would also end up with that same fate? Certainly, uh, genetics play a huge role as well, and, and you're correct, you know, a, a child could be more likely to be obese if their parent is. And it also has to do with not just genetics, but the parents act as role models. Sure. So they're acting as a role model for their children. It's important to practice healthy habits so that their children end up practicing healthy habits. Got a couple seconds left. You work for Metafast. Is there a website that people can check out? Yes, that you they can go to metafastnow.com uh, to learn more about obesity, about healthy eating, and how meal replacements can can also help um, with healthy weight management strategies. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. Thank you, you very much for having yeah, me. Hang tight for one second because picking up those good habits, as we were saying, could be tough. A recent study finds fewer than 3% of Americans follow the basic health behaviors necessary to avoid cardiovascular disease. And those behaviors include a healthy diet, moderate exercise, maintaining a healthy body weight, and not smoking. Now, would you eat less if you knew just how much exercise you need to do in order to burn that food off? It's a concept that some experts are pushing, but as Erica Edwards reports, others say it's a no-size-fits-all approach. A decadent box of chocolates may not look as appetizing when you find out you'd have to exercise for 40 minutes to burn off those calories. What we want to prompt people to do is to think differently. It doesn't mean you wouldn't have a chocolate bar, but you might have one rather than two. Shirley Kramer of the UK's Royal Society of Public Health suggests adding the activity equivalent to the calories listed on food labels. On this mock-up of a soda, the can would clearly show a person would have to run for 15 minutes or bike for 23 to work off the calories in the soft drink. Outside experts say it could offer a better way of digesting food label information that many consumers find confusing. The simpler we can make it, the more we can make it you know, very easy and accessible for the consumer, the more it actually ends up doing some good and impacting what people choose. This simple idea is much more complex in reality and not a one-size-fits-all approach. The exercise needed to burn off a select number of calories is much different for a 250-pound man, for example, than it would be for a slender teenage girl. Some say it might be more effective to take exercise out of the equation, focusing instead on healthy foods that keep people fuller longer. Erica Edwards, WBAL-TV 11 News. Erica, thanks, but as people work to get healthy, doctors say some are really taking it too far. New eating disorders emerging. Hadn't heard of this before. It's called orthorexia, and as Daniel Barber explains, it forms when someone has an unhealthy obsession with eating only foods they perceive to be healthy, pure, or detoxifying. That's when clean eating kind of takes over and actually begins to cause you problems. It's called orthorexia, and while eating healthy is good for you, Michelle Jorgensen says going overboard could lead to more dangerous eating disorders like anorexia. Clean eating got so severe that they started restricting and then we couldn't help them get better because their food choices were so narrow they couldn't, wouldn't eat enough to get healthy again. Doctors say repeatedly restricting what you eat can cause malnutrition and other serious health issues. Anytime you're cutting out everything, you do need to be careful. Where are my proteins? Where are my dietary fats? Is this just fruits and vegetables? Because you cannot get all your nutrition from fruits and vegetables. An indication that someone might be dealing with orthorexia is when it prevents a person from socializing. Clean eating in adolescence can become a problem where they stop eating with families. Um, I'm not eating that. What is that? I already ate. I'm not eating that crap. And then it's easy to move in then to an eating disorder because you're limiting, 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 limiting what you eat. While orthorexia could cause a person to eat fewer foods or stop eating altogether, there's another eating disorder that it could trigger. Any of us, if we restrict. I, I'm on this crash diet, whether it be clean eating or anything else. If I restrict, I'm going to set myself up to then later binge because I haven't adequately nourished my body. If you are a clean eater, Jorgensen says to balance your nutritional needs and to pay attention to any behavioral changes.